You know, something, something that was announced 23 years ago as a, as a great idea, as the new concept for humanity. And here we are still going down the drain. I mean, it, it's something that's kind of either wrong with the definition or wrong with the way we're, we're selling it. Right, right. The other thing is that people think we need a scientific definition of sustainable development. But sustainable development is like justice or love or something. We, we generally know what it means, but it's hard to define it precisely. So it's much more useful, I think, in, to, to think in terms of the, the transition to sustainable practices, the transition to sustainability. And then every, everything we're doing, whether it's trade or investment or, or whatever, to, to think in terms of how can trade, which is an incredibly powerful engine, how can we harness that to pull us towards sustainability? What do we need to do to trade policy uh, to, to, to make sure that it starts taking us in the direction we want to go? And that's true with all these other policy areas. Right. And we've been afraid to, to go too close to them because we're used to speaking to our peers, we want to stay among the environmentalists, and it just leads us to being um, much more ineffective than we could otherwise be. And what, I, what, I, what makes me a little bit optimistic is, is that you, you talk to trade policy people, you, you talk to investment bankers, you, you talk to technology developers, they know we have to go this way. Right, right. And they know that the current practices are not taking us there. And they're open to any new ideas. Right. Like they don't think we can shut down the world as we know it and create a new one tomorrow from a different model. And that's not going to happen. But uh, if we can come up with something realistic, um, I think we can get there. When I started working on trade and environment with the World Trade Organization, I, um, I went in there and, and and said, look guys, trade is having this impact on the environment, you need to shift your policy. And, and they all kind of looked at our proposals and they, and they didn't work. And I realized that, that um, the trade world, like any other world, is a world of its own. It's got its own culture, it's got its own, its own uh, practices, it's got its own language, it's got its own secret codes. And uh, I realized that the challenge for me, and this is the way I, I describe it, was we had to write environmental software that ran on the WTO's operating system. Right. We were coming up with programs that actually didn't run on their system. They, the people didn't think they were bad ideas, it's just they didn't work in, in that context. Right. So we have to understand how that world works and then design software for it. I mean, I think what you were saying about, about the opportunities in the private sector, there's a, there's a sort of, I guess, I guess a, a widespread or very pervasive sentiment in the U.S. among the older environmentalists that business, because it, it's, it's structured to try and deliver a profit on a quarterly basis, is simply a dead end when it comes to change. But I think that, that, that the younger generation doesn't see it that way at all. It sees much more vitality and creativity in the private sector, potentially, because they see themselves as, as sort of potential entrepreneurs who could be creating green jobs and doing these sort of things. I think the thing to do is to look for alternatives to centralized government function. Yeah. You know, if you look at the, the, the Copenhagen process, they tried to push through an accord that required a consensus of 192 countries. It, it, this is not going to happen. It'll never happen on an issue where the consequences of that agreement, if it's any good, are to reshape the way economies run. Right. It's not going to happen. So what's the alternative? Now, if you actually look where we've been making real progress on climate change, it's in companies, it's in municipalities, it's at the state level. We've got the Western Climate Initiative that, that, that links Canadian provinces with states in the United States. Uh, we need to identify where that's happening and scale it up. And if we do that, it won't matter that we can't reach an agreement in Copenhagen or, or in successors. It won't matter because the movement will happen anyway. Right. And I think we've been placing far too much faith in our governments, the governments that we elect, you know, going to international conferences and making concessions and agreeing and finding a middle way. And I just don't, I think that era is over. I, th I think, uh, I think Copenhagen spelled the, the death of, of a particular approach to solving international environmental problems and we now have to come up with a better one. What do you think about the, um, the, the, the argument that gets surfaced sometimes that ultimately the, the, the linchpin in the solution is a Chinese-US agreement? 
and that, and that nothing will really, as long as that's as, as long as that hasn't been forged, the rest is sort of you know is, is never going to have the critical mass to make a big difference. I, I am afraid I think that that assumes that China wants to make an agreement with the United States on this, rather than uh, an agreement with India, Brazil, South right, Africa, right, and, right. and others. And, and uh, you know, one interpretation, and I think it has a lot of merit, of, of why China was so um, tough in Copenhagen and, and has been blamed by a lot of people for, for, for tripping up a, a significant agreement, is that any significant agreement out of Copenhagen uh, out of the climate change process is going to provide a massive incentive to unleash creativity and innovation in moving towards a low carbon economy. Right. Um, if they do that, the United States will come on top because they've got the creativity, they've got the investment capital, they've got, they've got the technology. Mm -hmm. China's not far behind and what China, I think, wants to do is to put off that day until they know that they can dominate the field. But I think the United States should be very, very careful because that day is not far off. That's a good answer. Lots of things come That's that, that is interesting. <laughs> I wonder if the Chinese really have that sort of yes, they do. Vision. That's good. Yes, they do. And and I would be very worried if I was the U.S. And what's holding it back in the U.S. is, of course, the Congress. And and um, somebody said to me that you know a hard-nosed American realist said to me before Copenhagen. There is no point in adopting any agreement that the administration can't sell to Congress. There's just no point. And the administration, knowing that, is never going to accept an agreement that they don't think they can get through Congress. But let me tell you that an agreement that they can get through Congress would fall so far short of dealing with the problem that it wouldn't be worth adopting. Right, right, right. So there's the, the, the answer to climate change in America right. is not in the Congress. It's in yeah. developing a movement. Yep. It's in getting the incentives right. And it will happen. This is an incredibly creative country. It's a country that, that moves fast when it's convinced. We should, what, what would you think about, about an editorial where we sort of lay that position out to the American public and sort of say, listen, you have a window of opportunity oh, to be man. the leaders in innovation on this problem. And in five or ten years, you may have you may have passed, passed the torch over to another part yeah. of the world. Yeah. And you may be playing catch up to late. I think it would be interesting to, to so, lay out that interpretation of why China behaved yeah. the way it did. The most incredible spectacle in Copenhagen That's was really Obama w knocking on the door and being asked to wait while China, India, and Brazil met. <laughs> right. President Obama right. waiting. <laughs> now, why do you think that was happening? It was because China did not want to be put in a position where it had to deal with the United States alone. They wanted to ensure that they had a, a lineup yeah. of very significant countries, big players in the climate game, uh, who, are in, who are with them on this. So they could say to the U.S., look, hey, uh, we're happy for you to come on board, but this is what you're coming on board with. Right. right. And th this is a, a huge geopolitical shift that, that we haven't fully digested yet. And a very interesting one. Now, I, I, I tend to be an admirer of the way China can take a problem and move towards a solution very vigorously. And they don't have the problems of dealing with a, a Congress the way we do here. They don't have the same uh, democracy. But they are very determined, they're very strategic thinkers, and they know where their allies are. And so I think this, this assumption, right? the other thing that I think died of Copenhagen is this notion that powerful countries could push a solution through. That if the United States, the European Union, Japan, Australia were on the, same, on the right mm -hmm. line, mm -hmm. they could just exert enough uh, political pressure to push things through. What we've discovered is that those countries still have enough power to block a solution, but not right. to impose one. What you said is, I mean, if you look at China over the past 40, 50 years, they made a commitment to sort of improving health and welfare. Mao made that commitment. And life expectancy sort of shot up in a couple of decades. They made a commitment to increasing income. And income shot up very quickly over a couple of decades. They have a, they have a, an, a remarkable ability to change the fate of a billion people in a very short time. It's, it does, it, 
can you can, can a country like climate change make that sort of progress on an issue like climate? Uh, can a country like China make that sort of progress on an issue like climate change, or does it have to be operating with, you know, several other big players? Because on social policy, economic policy, you're right. They they get a vision. They 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 set a two decade time frame. But you know, and they move. During all this time that China has been justifiably criticized for human rights abuses, for, for lack of democracy, they have taken between three and four hundred billion people out of poverty. Yeah, exactly. That is the single greatest development a, success in the history of humanity. Right, right. And it was done over a few years. Now China... Remarkably quick. I am, I am convinced that China gets it on climate change. Not only that they get it, but that they're seriously worried. But they, they are in a dilemma. They're in a huge dilemma. They depend on, on coal-fired power for most of their electricity. Their experience with large-scale hydropower has been, it's been a bit of a disaster. Yeah. Um, and they're, although they're pushing in renewables as, as quickly as they can, there's still some way to go before they make a, a significant dent. So China's kind of caught on, on the, the horns of a dilemma, because on the one hand, they're convinced they need to do this, even if it's just for their own interest. You know, right, right, even right. leaving the planet aside for China's future. Um, hmm. At the same time, they cannot cut back on energy development because they're growing, their economy is growing at 10% a year and, 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 they, and they need the energy. So it is difficult. Now, I, I wish that we, we were all getting together to find solutions for everybody's problem, but our governments don't seem to be doing that. And as I say, if I have faith in what's happening in the, in the U.S., it's because of the... The, the movement you see in, in city governments and in, 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 um, in these coalitions of states in a number of companies to really move fast in this area. I think once it's broadly understood that uh, the future depends on who wins the race to dominating the low carbon economy market, right, uh, right. the U.S. will, will, will spur itself right, right. And, and begin to move really quickly. And that is something that, that, this isn't a matter of politics, this isn't a matter of Republicans versus Democrats, this is just the future of the U.S. economy. Yeah. Uh, everybody's in favor of, of a healthy economy and of, uh, of a successful transition to a, a new approach. Is it, I mean, the big arguments you're making about climate change, sustainability, the U.S., China, they're very, I think, they're immediately understandable and compelling. Why isn't a UNEP, an IUC, and something that has, that, that's able to mobilize, you know, lots and lots of players. Why aren't they creating a framework like that, that people can all sort of, you know, orient themselves with them? Because, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if, if, if one of these, these organizations that has the year of, of a thousand conservation groups sort of laid out, made it practical like this, sort of laid out the, laid out the, the, the challenge in a pragmatic way, and people could say, okay, we understand China's dilemma. So we understand that, that we've got to help them negotiate a pathway through this dilemma. We understand the opportunity for the U.S. We've got to put pressure on the U.S. to take advantage of its entrepreneurial, you know, sort of, sort of reservoir of talent here. Well, I think that, that far too many of us were, 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 were tied up in the whole Copenhagen process. There was right. such a mobilization yeah. around Copenhagen. I mean, 30,000 people went to the conference. There right, were, right. Uh, organizations like, like WWF had, had 80 people there. Uh, they had press people, they had, they had uh, top diplomats, they had, they had former heads of state. They all converged on Copenhagen. The idea was that you can't say no to this mass of talent. And, and, and uh, what we discovered <laughs> is that you can. And, and not only that, it's easy. <laughs> and so, when Copenhagen collapsed, I mean, I, I you know, I think of uh, the, the image of, of a beached whale, you know, the, right. all these people are, are there pouring buckets of water over it, but there's, there's no way it's going to survive. You, you, you can't drag it back <laughs> into the sea because it would die anyway. Right. And so, all of a sudden, Copenhagen collapses, Christmas is upon us, and everybody's asking, well, what next? And I think, you know, this is the beginning of 2010, we're starting to see that uh, a lot of creative talent is going into figuring out what next. Right. We know it's not that. Right. And that doesn't mean we should shut down the whole uh, UNFCCC. Uh, there are aspects that actually can move forward. There are parts of the Copenhagen Accord or the Climate Change 
challenge that that are ripe for for mm -hmm. uh, progress in, in that, but but not the big framework. And uh, I was in Washington last, uh, few, last week with uh, the CEO of something called the the Carbon War Room, the Carbon War Room, and this guy is is wants to. Uh, be a place where we orient private investment capital into the transition to a low, a low carbon economy. He wants to take that market and dominate it. Right. This is a guy who set up a very successful solar energy company and, and yeah. ran it for a few years and sold it. And he is working with George Soros and Richard Branson and all these people. This is the future. And he, he has no doubt about it whatsoever. Right. Right. He wants the US to, to dominate that market. The Koreans are, are keen on dominating that market. China wants to dominate that market. The day we, we the day that the only game in town is this mass scramble to dominate the the, the, the technology, investment capital, and know how to make that transition to a low carbon economy, then we're on the right track. Because then it will happen fast. Excellent. Thanks very That's much, Mark. Not my feeling.